What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Anthony, back with another edition of the Fourth Man Podcast. Thanks again to everyone for tuning in and hope everyone's having an awesome day. Really cool episode coming up. As you've seen from the title of the video, you know who today's guest is going to be in our interview. It's going to be Jeff Ayers with Bivouac. Got a little Bivouac representation on the show, which is, I feel like, pretty rare. It's always hard to get the Aliens guys and the Bivouac guys. But before we get into the interview, we have some updates on the league, some big updates. I would say more off the court than on the court, but it, you know, it directly affects it. And I uh, want to give a quick shout out, you know, before we get into all of that. So thanks again for tuning into the episode. Again, make sure you guys are following on social media at Fourth Man Pod, subscribed on YouTube, continuing to try to do more and more from a content perspective, whether it's, you know, try to... <laughs> join the rave of YouTube shorts or just do different. I want to try to do different types of content for YouTube. So not everything you're seeing on social media, you're also seeing when you go on YouTube. So that's what I'm trying to attempt. TikTok game going up just a little bit, trying to get more of some clips from the podcast out. But nonetheless, all that to be said is I appreciate any support and it'd be just as greatly appreciated if you, you know, follow on other platforms. If not, if you're more of just a podcast listener or more of a visual person and like YouTube, that's cool too. Um, just some things I'm currently and, and honestly always trying to work on as we continue to bring awareness around the big three and update you guys. Uh, what I think is one of the, the best leagues in the league so or in the world. So, you know, appreciate any and all support. Make sure you're following on social media, subscribed on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash fourth man pod. And for those of you listening on Dash Radio, we appreciate the support. The support, Dash Radio, nothing but net channel, just giving us another platform to talk about the big three and some basketball. So, like I said, before we get to the Jeff Ayers interview, the funny part about this actually is that I already had the intro and outro to this recorded, but then some big news came out within the big three. A couple of big things that came out that I want to touch on. The first being that the big three season six expected to come back. They just announced that they are continuing their partnership with CBS. So the big three will be back on CBS in the summer of 2023. And I think that's more of just, you know, it's an expectation, but also a, a sigh of relief. We've known in the past, the I would say the past couple of years that there's been some rumors or some some tweets that have been posted out there that have been kind of saying, you know, there's some, some issues with capital or, you know, there's been some rumors about new investors, although some of that was cap, you know, uh, no pun intended, but Colin Kaepernick, you know, it was announced he was an investor and that, and that, you know, that wasn't true. So uh, all that to be said, it's a little bit of a sigh of relief to say like, okay, like I just keep taking over as CEO. That was already like a really good sign. Uh, and then now a partnership to renew season six. I really think Ice Cube as a CEO is a huge game changer for this league. I think that when he's really, you can tell like at this point, like this is his baby. He wants this thing to succeed. He seems, he sees that there's a little bit of a, downward spiral or tough to get like an, uh, an upward trajectory to go following the season of being off. So he stepped in and I think he's going to make some um, incremental changes, not only to, you know, I would say not only to the league, but also just to the, how do I, how do I put this? Not only just to the league and what they're doing on the court, but also just to with the staff and the personnel involved and, and, and behind the scenes things that, uh, you just want to correct and make sure that everything is professional and in tip top, you know, tip top peak performance when you're going out and just, you know, showcasing, you know, your product, your, for him, his baby. So I think Ice Cube stepping in the CEO was a huge deal. And now we're seeing that they're going to have, you know, continue on CBS, a bit, another, you know, a big platform. I think that garners interest from guys that maybe haven't played in a while or just guys that have never really had a, a big stage, you know, that's continuing to show that effort, but also just to be able to, to, you know, display this type, this basketball to thousands, maybe sometimes millions of viewers across the nation and wherever else they're watching from. So uh, good to see that season six is coming back. Good to see that they're still on CBS. And, you know, again, an expectation from someone like me and maybe within the big three community, but I think also a little bit of uh, a few, like glad, or it's more like, Phew, like glad the, the league is returning for a season six. And despite any kind of complications, we're continuing to try to make this work, right? Because it, again, I, I've mentioned this a lot already in the early off season, but this is a startup things. You have to adjust and adapt to different things that are going on. And when things aren't working, you can't just tell everybody else that, Hey, stop what's going on so we can correct and 
you know, work on some of the mistakes so that we can ultimately make this perfect. And then you guys can pick up everything you're doing. Like the world doesn't stop for you. The world doesn't stop for anybody. And so there's going to be some ups and downs. And I think they've, they've experienced a couple of downs, but the challenges that they're facing are only going to make this league, you know, that much better. And they're going to be able to, you know, instill best practices moving forward as they continue to, to, to grow. I mean, this is only season six. So hopefully this, you know, this is kind of a, a returning a new leaf or turning a new page here. Uh, that being like, there's not going to be like any more like down the stretch issues that we've maybe seen over the past couple of years. So long story short, season six, we'll be back on CBS. The other piece of news and, and maybe the bigger story here is that the big three recently announced or it was recently announced that the big three has now been certified as a black owned business. They're the first professional sports league to be certified by, by black, the U S black chamber of commerce as a black owned and operated business. This is huge. They're again, the big three constantly and ice cube, you know, has a big, is a big reason why, but the big three is constantly trying to change the game, be the first to the not, not so much, just because they want to be the first, obviously, but continuing to do things in a different light, you know, doing things that maybe not are as comfortable to the norm, but also leave that residual everlasting effect on, uh, on not only the league, but the people involved with it. And maybe even those outside of it, like we've seen some rules that he's, he's, uh, you know, added to the league in the big three that, you know, been tested in the waters by by leagues like the NBA and and the NBA G League and things like that. So just trying to leave that everlasting effect. And again, like for Cube, like his thing is always, I feel like he's just, you know, always trying to help out, always trying to make sure everyone's in a, in a good position and, and making sure like everyone eats. And again, you know, he he's doing that by, you know, becoming or helping the big three become the first professional sports league to be certified um, as a black owned and operated business. Not only are they the first, but they're the only right now. So here's a little bit of a quote from Ice Cube himself. He says, quote, myself and the entire league are honored to be officially certified by Buy Black and the U.S. Black Chambers. From day one, the league has been dedicated to providing opportunities for black players, fans, investors, and partners. And we are proud to be a part of a nationwide network of black business owners. Supporting Black Enterprise is a lifelong passion of mine, and the Big Three will continue to build upon its success and lift up other Black entrepreneurs, end quote. And, you know, this is just kind of a, a continuation of what he's already doing with, you know, contract with Black America, continuing to try to get, you know, Black entrepreneurs and Black organizations um, just more opportunities, uh, you know, more businesses and and be able to just give them, I guess, a, a better start and opportunity than maybe uh, entrepreneurs like maybe Ice Cube himself or others like didn't necessarily have. So he's continuing to to give back in any way possible and just continuing to, you know, change change how we like operate or not how we, but change how sports leagues are operated in general. Obviously, we've seen, you know, the involvement with the blockchain and, and NFT tiers uh, that have ultimately resulted in you know having different owners for different teams uh through crypto no no league was doing that now he becomes the first you know black owned certified professional sports league like just continuing to to, to make this uh you know a one of one you know a unicorn of what's of some sorts and not not only do i like think like oh like this is great uh, what cube's doing and what you know you know, how the league wants to be represented. This is exactly how they, you know, they would like to do so. But I think too, like you think about other aspects of this, like now you're in a, a network of other black entrepreneurs who potentially, you know, if they're in the right position could now like advertise or work alongside the league and for the big three itself, you have other partners and contributors that want to support this league. You got uh, other people within that network that can spread awareness or, or, be involved or, you know, continuing to just put the word out there about the big three to not only, you know, those companies or those entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and, and their companies, but also to the consumers of those companies as well. That might be, you know, like tied hand in hand to some of those companies are like, oh, what are they doing with the big three? Like you have an entire network to partner with and work alongside with, um, you know, doing this. So it, it just seems like a, a win-win for everybody here. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is huge. Like, I, I don't think I'm making a, a big enough deal about this, but 
it could be a little bit because I'm under the weather, but this is a, a huge monumental milestone, not only for the big three, but for sports leagues in general, like the, like the everlasting impact on this is, is a, is monumental. And I am excited for, you know, what the league continues to do, but also excited to do what the, what they do now because they have this title, uh, you know, this title and, and and see if, you know, how other sports leagues react as well. Like I'm, I'm excited to see how the, like I mentioned earlier that, you know, the after effects or the residual effects of, of what happens because they, you know, have gone out and, and, you know, gotten this title. So big three continuing to, to change the game and just, what I what I think I love about this is just another another way that the big three is trying to like continue to partner with other companies, entrepreneurs, um, you know, uh, just pe people with like prominent names and 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 in the limelight, like the like they're continuing to try to just partner with anybody and everywhere they can to not only like you know have more people aware about the league and get more people involved, but just to make this league the best as it possibly can. I mean, like we talked about. Uh, and we talked about the NFT and, and crypto aspect that the big three implemented last year. I mean, think of the people that are involved with that. Like you got some, some of the biggest names and the, and the NFT crypto Solana Ethereum space uh, or Doge space for even the Dogecoin guys. Uh, you got guys like Snoop Dogg and PayPal co-founders and uh, yeah, Gary B involved with it. So, I mean, that's one aspect of it. Again, like you have your whole network now, uh, you know, within the, the U S black chambers, uh, network and the buy black network. And then not to mention like they're, the big three is already partnered with, you know, companies like Microsoft. Um, you know, they introduced heat vision through, through Microsoft and, and NOAA basketball analytics. So they're trying to make this like, you know, uh, like they're trying to kind of get in with what everyone's doing in the, in the world of analytics, but just be able to help their players understand, you know, some things maybe they could correct from an analytical standpoint. You know, we, they're already they're partnering with companies like like Monster. They had a big three celebrity game with guys like Brock and and Ellie Chapa, Wallow and Gilly. Like so, like you know, the collaborations and the partnerships, I think, are 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 really like the biggest takeaway. If you look at this from an overall like vision perspective, like yeah, like maybe think some things haven't worked out or it's been harder to build like that fan base, um, you know, through three on three basketball league in the summer, but because of who they're collaborating with and partnering with, I think that ultimately is going to be what ties everything together, what uh, makes this league go steady and strong and ultimately pushes them into, you know, maybe not like an NBA or NFL tier like anytime soon, but at least pushes them in that direction to, you know, just be uh, on, a, on a bigger, bigger stage, uh, higher level, and just be a little bit more well-respected because there's a lot of, great players in this league there's a lot of good people within that are involved with this league uh, and it, it's honestly it's a great sport it's a great product it's fun it's entertaining it's fast paced you know the the season isn't super long so it just adds that more that much more like excitement and exuberance you know throughout the summer uh, you get your basketball fix on at, you know rather than trying to see some inside looks on some underground like uh, you know, summer league games or red games, you know, you got big three basketball with some of the best to ever do it with some of the the greatest to ever do it on the sidelines coaching. So, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm pitching the big three to everyone who listens in, who I, I think is already a fan of the league. So maybe I'm just beating a dead horse here, but just uh, I'm impressed continuously with what the league's doing. I, I think, already through early in the season six off season, they're making a lot of strides uh, as I mentioned earlier. And I'm excited to see how this, uh, this league continues to evolve, but just, you know, congrats and, and kudos on, you know, again, changing the game and being the first professional sports league to be certified as a black owned and operated business and the only sports league at this point. So congrats to everyone involved and everyone in the big three. And, and again, I'm just, repeat myself nonstop here, but that's that I, I again I can't tell if that's the excitement or I, I'm just just feeling the cold. But nonetheless, uh congrats. Once again, maybe it's just uh, I'm at uh, part of one of my symptoms of being sick is is forgetting 
forgetfulness. Uh, I, I can't even speak anymore. Moving on, I just want to give a quick shout out to a few guys with, you know, that are have played in the big three uh, or, you know, especially as most recently as this past summer that are playing overseas right now that are just like balling out. Uh, if you're not already following on social media, I, I posted this on Instagram and maybe Twitter that Kevin Murphy recently dropped 53 points. He's currently playing over in Kuwait. It was a comeback win. They needed a big performance from him or from somebody and they got it from who better else than the big three MVP, Kevin Murphy. He scored 53 points, uh, helped his team advance to the final four. Just an unreal performance. He took him a little, little while to get going. I think the team wasn't necessarily like relying on him early on, but you know, they were falling behind and and in that second quarter really took off. And I think it just never stopped from there. So just want to give a shout out to Kevin Murphy. Also want to give a shout out to a, a couple of guys playing in the PBA over in the Philippines. They're playing as import players. And I think they're just playing in this like this cup or this tournament. But Quincy Miller, Earl Clark, two guys that are going absolutely ballistic uh, berserk over over there in the Philippines. I mean, their their stats are ridiculous right now. I, I think I actually made a post too on Quincy Miller, but need to get my uh need to just recognize and, and shout out Earl Clark as well because they have been doing some insane work over there in the PBA, uh, you know, during this like tournament. So I wanted to pull up their stats real quick because I, I feel like some things have probably changed. So Quincy Miller's played in four games, Earl Clark's played in five games in this in the 47th season of the PBA Commissioner's Cup. Quincy Miller currently averages 35, almost 36 points a game, 15 and a half rebounds, and just under three blocks and two steals, all while also dishing out four, just a little over four assists and shooting 51% from the field. That's pretty nuts. If you think that's nuts, Earl Clark's numbers are just as crazy. Playing in five games, he's averaged 32 points, 17 rebounds, the defensive player of the year in the big three also averages over three blocks a game and just under one and a half steals a game while dishing out 3.8 assists per game. Um, that's pretty insane. He's also shooting 44% from three. So just ex absolute dominance from guys who played really well this year, you know, in the big three. So to see them, you know, continue to do that and just, you know, continue to showcase their talents, not only like in the States here, but, you know, do their thing overseas like they've been doing so for so long. Just, just cool to see. You know, uh, you know the big three representation and how talented these guys are. And I, I just love to see them play over like all. I guess big three off season and then see them come back and see how you know they perform uh, against one another. It's really cool. But shout out to those guys: Kevin Murphy, Quincy Miller, Earl Clark. Keep doing your thing and hope the rest of the overseas season continues to go well. All right, that being said, I think I've done enough rambling. So let's get to our interview with Jeff Ayers from Bivlac. Again, make sure you're following the show on social media at Fourth Man Pod, subscribing and hit that notification bell on YouTube. And if you tune in on Dash Radio, we appreciate you guys. As always, quick word from the sponsor today, and then we'll get to our interview with Jeff Ayers. Real quick, before we get to our interview with Jeff Ayers, I want to quickly talk to you again about Drip. So I know I've mentioned Drip a couple of times, but if you're new to the show or haven't heard yet, Drip is a live streaming platform where you can buy and sell uh, abundance of different types of sports cards, Pokemon cards, Funko Pops, sports memorabilia, pretty much anything and everything that you can collect, you can probably get on Drip in one centralized location. And right now, if you download the app using my link in the description below, you can actually get $15 off your first purchase of $20 or more anywhere on the app. Look, just like the big three is doing for basketball, Drip is constantly trying to change the game for all types of collectors out there. So make sure you use my link if you are a collector. It's in the description below and download the app today to get $15 off your first purchase of $20 or more. And now, like I promised, here's our interview with Jeff Ayers from Bitwack. All right, cool. Well, Today, we're excited to welcome on NBA champion and first round pick in the most recent Big Three draft, representing Bivouac, Jeff Ayers. Jeff, again, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. And welcome to the fourth man. Uh, Anthony, thanks for having me, man. Uh, it's an honor to be on here. 
And it's an honor to have you. Like I said, we don't get a lot of big black representation. So I'm always excited. I'm amped up for this one. And yeah, let's let's start here, you know, before we get into the big three, because I always like to talk a little bit about the journey and kind of summarize, you know, how you got to this point as, as best as possible. I want to start with kind of going back to your college career, because okay. that's really where I, I started following you. I'm a huge James Harden fan. He's probably mm -hmm. my favorite player in the NBA. And you got the opportunity to play alongside him. Would love to know just kind of, you know, what that was like playing alongside of him and then just, you know, how he's developed into a, you know, MVP caliber player and one of the best in the league, you know, how, what's it like to be able to like watch that growth from, you know, your former teammate? That was really cool, man. I remember he came in, you know, was a young, chunky, little baby face kid, you know what I mean? No beard, nothing. And, uh, no hair, no, just this young kid wanting to hoop and, um, you know, at first I was a little apprehensive. You know, I got people telling me he's going to help change everything. And I'm going into my junior year, like, no, nah, no way. Like, this is my squad. Like, I'm the only upperclassman. Like, nobody's taking this from me. Ain't no freshman going to come here and help. Do you know what I got to play against? Like, these guys are monsters. Like, you guys are crazy. And, but lo and behold, James came in. He was freshman of the year. Killed it. And, I, you know, I was thought he was going to leave. But it was so dope. He came back for a sophomore season, my senior year, and then we just – crushed it like our little encore chemistry was so so good and you know I mean I had an NBA career you know I give a lot of credit to him you know what I mean they, they, people like you people coming to watch him play and you know him put on a show and then I'm just out there doing my thing and you know because of how great he was you know I got a chance so it was really it was really cool and you know still be cool with him to this day you know as he's gone from you know this high school kid starting to play college to, you know, been, being an MVP and Olympic champion or one of the best players in the world is really dope, man, to, to see it. And, you know, when I see him over the summers, it's cool to catch up with him and see he's still him. Yeah, that's amazing. I think the, the coolest part about that, because I feel like uh, his reputation can sometimes be misconstrued within the media and whatnot. But the cool part is, you know, you guys were boys back in the day and it wasn't like, all right, I'm off to the NBA to do better things peace you know he's like he's still connected yeah. with you so so love the camaraderie did you ever think that if he was going to have a nickname of any sort it would be the beard no I'll tell you man when i first met him he had nothing man he that's just insane baby face kid mm -hmm. you know so it was just that was really cool for him to you know for to, to see and him kind of grow into this you know create an identity for himself you know it's really hard in the nba so many stars and so many good basketball players it gets difficult to just want to stand out and you know, he had the, the game and then he had the name that kind of went with it, made it more household. And it stuck, man. He's rocked it out. It's been really cool. No, no doubt. No doubt. And, you know, you kind of alluded to a little bit. Both of you guys went on to be able to play in the NBA following your senior year, his sophomore year. So kind of fast forward into your NBA career. You know, obviously, I mentioned at the top, you're an NBA champion. But during your time with the Spurs, I got to ask, what's it like to be in a huddle with, you know, people like Greg Popovich and Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, you know? <laughs> on a Ginobili. I mean, what's that like? And, uh, you know, for you? Honestly, it was really cool, like, to be around people that do things at the most professional level, like the most professional way. Uh, to be in a timeout and see Coach Pop not even sit in the chair and let, like, Timmy or Tony take over the timeout and talk and talk to the guys, you know, talk to us, or, you know, Pop screaming on us. And then, you know, I've, I've, I have moments where, you know, I'm in the timeout and I'm like so nervous and he could tell and he's like, Jeffrey, like, just, just calm down. It's all right. And I'm like, all right, cool. And then there's other moments where I'm in the timeout and he's ripping my head off. Like, Damn it, Jeffrey, what the hell are you doing? And I'm just like, oh, crap. Like, That's why I was nervous in the first I'm, place. Yeah, I might not play for three weeks now. Holy cow. <laughs> but uh, just the amount of respect that they all have for each other. Um you know, as crazy as Pop seems sometimes, he's really, like, super calculated and and direct and deliberate with a lot of the things he does. So, and Timmy and Manu and Tony, they they read that. They didn't just see him, you know, getting texts and getting thrown out the game. He was like, all right, guys, like, Pop did that for us. Like, it's time to step it up. Like, let's go in the game and get up out of here. And most of the time, that's exactly what happened. It was so cool. That's so dope. I was watching an interview recently. I think it was from a couple of years ago with one of your former teammates, Matt Bonner. And one thing I found interesting within there uh, was the South side that you kind of coined <laughs> for yeah. the end of the bench group. I would love for you to talk yeah. a little bit more about that. Uh, who was involved, like, you know, within that, the South side, because he said, like, people like Monty, obviously they were cut out. 
Uh, yeah, like no, they're not allowed in the south side. But uh, would love to know a little bit more about that. And then, you know, who kind of <laughs> excelled since that time, you know, in the south side? I mean, at Siege, almost everybody. Um, it was me, Matt, probably Corey Joseph. I think Nando DeCola was in there until he, you know, wanted to get traded. Uh, Baines, Austin Day. Wow. Uh, we had a guy, his name's uh, Reggie. Oh, crap. I can't remember his name. He's a lefty. Uh, another guy that was in, like, the south side was, like, Jermichael, Jermichael Green. Like, wow. you know what I mean? There's, like, some guys that are really doing their thing right now. Uh, I think Kyle might have been a part of the south side, like Kyle Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it was just, like, the south side of the bench, you know, the guys that don't get ticked that often. Like, And the head trainer, Will, like, he loved it. So we always be yelling, South Side, South Side. Like, and then it's like when, so when we would get in the game, we would all be hyped for each other. Like, you know, it was just like we're all in a little group. And uh, the South Side was also, we would do this thing called the Bonner Challenge. This is a, some, it's a legendary thing, man. It's really cool. What, what is the Bonner Challenge? Uh, so the Bonner Challenge is the first shot of the day, pre-warm-up. You got to make a right-hand layup, left-hand layup, free throw, top of the key jumper, NBA three, and then go back without missing. Oh, man. <laughs> so, so you start over like, if you miss at any point. No, if you miss, you're done for the day. It doesn't, you gotta, you can't try again until tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> and, and what's the goal so, to, like, tally up how many times? Yeah, how many okay. times you completed the challenge by the end of the season. And uh, the champ would get, like, an actual, like uh, – we make like a WWE belt and put like the different, the different flags from the people that participated in the Bonner and uh, the, um, the skill development coach, uh, Chip England, when he was there, that's, that was his thing. He would do it too. Oh, so wow. like we'd have regular season Bonner challenges. We have playoff Bonners. Like it was such a cool little group and it was so dope. It's also <laughs> yeah, that, that's sick. Uh, you got to put on for the south side, not only the Spurs. And oh. I think I got to imagine that made winning a championship that much better with the camaraderie and the group you had. But I guess overall, I'm sure you've talked about this a million times, but even reflecting on it, you know, what was that experience like being a part of a championship team and, and with that group more specifically? Oh, it was nuts. Like, I think, you know, me going to that team was destiny. Like the year before I was in Indiana and we had lost to the, to the heat in the conference finals. Mm -hmm. Like we were like, you know, we went to seven games. We were one game away from going to play the Spurs for the championship. And, you know, that was two years in a row. We had lost to LeBron and the heat, the big three of heat. And it just sucked, man. Like, dang. And then I go to San Antonio. I'm already hyped. I've had old teammates like Yon Mahimi, George Hill tell me like, you get a chance, man, you need to go. Doesn't care how much the money is, how little it is. You need to go. So it'll be the best name for you. And so, all right, cool. So when I had the chance, I jumped at it. But then I remember, like, one of the first practices we get there, Coach Pops in the film room, and he plays that game, was it game six, where Ray hits the three and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And he's like, uh, everybody talks about the shot. And, you know, that's great. He made a heck of a play. But he went through a bunch of other stuff that happened that whole game that's like, it's not just one shot. There's right. 20 things that if we would have done right, we would have won the game by 15 points. And it's just like, guys, like, we want to go back. Like, they had this sour taste in their mouth. They were really, like, angry about losing. And I've, I've kind of felt the same way about losing to <laughs> yeah. the last two years in a row, too. Like, mm -hmm. damn. And so we were just like a match. And then just to go through that whole season where we had, like, a couple stretches where we won, like, 10, 15 games in a row, like, we were on a roll. I think we had the we had the best record in the league. We like it was nuts. And to have the meeting, sometimes Coach Pop is on everybody's head. Tony is not feeling comfortable. Like, man, I can't even play. I feel like I'm messing up. Like, Coach is gonna pull me because Coach didn't care. Pop, it doesn't matter who you are. I've seen the first ten seconds of the game. He'll pull Danny Green and sit him for the whole half. Like, because exactly. he wasn't he didn't he messed up or something. That's just how Pop did. And Tony Hall of Famer, man, still feeling nervous, close pop on him. <laughs> That's and so we had we would have talks as a team, just the guys. And you know, Tony and Tim and Mono were like, all right, guys, if we go talk to Pop and tell him to like relax a little bit, um, we can't mess up. Like we gotta play, we gotta play super hard, we gotta do everything he wants, because if we don't, it's gonna get worse. Like, and then we won't be able to like hold him back. It's gonna suck for everybody. 
Yeah. So we'll be like, all right. And then we all buy in as a team. You know, we're all dialed in and, and scouts and, you know, the guys on the south side are yelling out scouting report stuff like, no left, no left. Like, like we were mm-hmm. so dialed in that, you know, it was just so cool, man. We'd all, we'd all go together places. I, I know everybody's seen all the cool stuff with uh, Manu, Tiago, Boris, and Patty. Mm-hmm. They're like the four amigos, you know, going everywhere. <laughs> and it was just cool. Like, we all had, like, dynamics like that around the team, but it was never, like, clicky. Yeah. You know, we were all, like, one big family. It was so cool. I, that's amazing. And I think, too, you bring up a great point, especially within basketball. You just have to have the right people. Like, everybody's got to be on the same page for, you know, the, the success that you had and ultimately winning a championship. And sometimes that's that's hard to find. I'm, I'm sure you've been a part of teams that people didn't necessarily connect with each other and didn't have the same mission. So it's really mm-hmm. cool, like, you, join, you joining that team at that time, your past experience, coupled with, you know, their experience as a team to ultimately come together and, you know, Hold up another trophy. Hold up your first trophy. Yeah, yeah my first. And then, then, you know, it's like, it's crazy to hear, like, Coach Pop say, you know, like, guys, like, this is, like, out of the five, like, this is, like, the best one. And it's, wow. like, cool. Like, holy cow. Like, damn, how cool is that Yeah, like, feeling? And, like, I know, like, having them even told me, like, to know that you're a part of something like that, like, that group of guys, like, forever. Yeah. And, you know, there's four Hall of Famers on that. And, like, I you know, I talk to Timmy like he's like my big brother, and it freaks me out sometimes. So it's like, holy cow, this is really Tim Duncan. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I don't there's know. There's no you mean. way this is like. Right. Yeah, but you can kind of understand. Like, there's no way this is like my real life. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like I, I go through my phone sometimes. And I'm like, oh, the people's phone numbers I have. Like, there's no way. Like, this doesn't. This doesn't make sense. Or the big three was like another thing for me, man. Showing up and seeing all these guys I used to play with that I haven't seen in forever. It felt like. And, and to be like, Jeff, what's up, man? Like, where you been? And just, like, catching up. I'm like, all right, cool. Like, I wasn't just, like, this, like, ghost in the background in the league. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I was around. Like, mm-hmm. I, I had a name. Like, it was cool to, you know, and see these big name guys. And, you know, Gerald is my man. Like, that's my guy. I've known him for, for a while. And, you know, just to be on the same team, that was so cool in Indiana. You know, I see him doing the big three stuff. I was like, oh, this is my – I already know. That's my dude. And then they come and give me the phone call, like, yo, you're going to the box. I'm like, I already know. Like, Gerald, what's up, bro? Like, <laughs> so is that how the opportunity came about? Was it more so like you were already committed to playing in the big three and then it just so happened Gerald was joining or was it more so Gerald's in? So I was like, oh, I would like to play with nah, Gerald again. No, nah, I had like some some people that tell me to come and do it. And mm. I wanted to do it. Um, I had made a commitment earlier to go play in the, the TBT. So I wasn't sure, like, how the timing would be or anything. And, I, you know, the TBT team was, you know, they're all guys I've known for a long time. And so I was like, oh, I don't know. So I delayed it. But then I, was, I told him, I talked to T. Scott. I'm like, all right, man, like, send me the thing. Like, here's my stuff. Put me in the draft pool. Like, I won't be able to make the combine. Like, I was still in Japan. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I, I'm going to mess it. He's like, don't worry about it. So like, all right, cool. But then I don't hear anything. And so then I see, all right, all right Gerald's the captain of the Bivouac. I'm like, all right, this is cool. I, like, I know Barbosa. Barbosa's my guy. Like, I'm all right, cool. This is dope. Let's see what happens. No phone calls, nothing. It's just like, all right, this big, the big boss, like, Jeff, I was like, oh, that, okay. All right. And then I'm like, all right, it makes sense. That's my guy. Like, of course, Gerald's going to pick me. That's that's my dude. So, all right. I'm like, all right, I'm linking up again with Gerald Green. Oh, we're about to have some fun. Wait, that's that's pretty nuts. So, like, you kind of submit your application in a sense, and then it's just dead silent. Are you are you watching the draft to see what happens? Or are you yeah, that's like... exactly how I knew. That's like <laughs> I was watching it because like I didn't even know what was happening. I'm seeing it like on their Instagram feed. Like, hey, check out the draft. It's we're gonna stream it on YouTube. We're doing. I was like, oh, all right, cool. So I'm just at the house watching it. Like, all right, let's see what happens, man. Let's see if I get drafted. Like, I wasn't at the combine. Like, mm-hmm. who knows, man? It might not even happen. And then it was like I got. They said me. And then Gerald called me. I was like, you already know where we at, my man. Like, let's go get it. Let's go I, get it. Anyway. Yeah, hundred percent. I've talked to his brother Garland. Garland's been on the show mm-hmm. before, and I always thought the story was funny that, you know, he picked you first with kind of Gerald in the back of his mind that he was going to get Garland later, only for Garland to get taken uh, a little bit earlier. That's got to say something about your relationship, though, with uh, with Gerald, that he was willing to take you over his brother make sure that no, you, were, you were on the team. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, that's my guy, bro. Like, <laughs> like, like, we, me and that guy have been through the trenches, man. When we were in Indy, 
Like we went through a lot, man. And uh, like one of our last games, actually our last game of the season, we were playing the Heat in Miami. And like we're in the the game's over, we lost. Like everybody's pissed. Like I get in the game and I'm going in. Like me and Gerald are like going. And like I ended up getting in a scuffle with uh, Norris Cole, and Gerald is right there with me. Like <laughs> we, we, like he, that's why he knows. Like I'm with the smoke at all times. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not the one to back down. When I step on the court, I'm I'm going. I, off the court, I'm super chill. But on the court, man, I I, I can't stop. And he knows. He's like, if I'm going to war, like I need my guy Pen- like Pendy with me. I need Jeff with me. Sorry, right, cool. And so that game, like I got ejected. I think Gerald got ejected. We was getting in this argument with like Flo Rida and his manager. Like it was crazy. And it was just I look back at it now, I'm so embarrassed. Like, damn, what an idiot. Like, what am I doing? But like, I that's I know Gerald's my guy. He 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 was there right there with me. Like, I'm saying, like right here talking. Like, what'd you say? Like, don't be talking about that. Like, yo, what's up? <laughs> I'm like, Gerald, we good. Like, <laughs> they don't want none of this. Like, these dudes are sitting on the sideline. These guys are fans. Like, relax. We was ready. Nice. So, all right, airs, you're out of here. I was like, all right, cool. I, like, I, it was like in the first, there was like four minutes left in the game. I got oh, thrown wow. out of the game. Like, I got thrown out in like two or three, uh, two or three minutes. It was nuts. That That is insane. Uh, and so now you're getting the chance to go like go back in the trenches with Gerald. Let, let's talk a, a real quickly before I even get into this, because you talked about how you are on the court compared to you off the court. Your first big three game. First off, what a matchup <laughs> that was. But I got to yes. say, let, let me let me tell you from the outside perspective. I've been with watching the league for a long time, right? See mm-hmm. Michael Beasley come in. And this can go one or two ways. I've seen this. He's either going to be juiced up, ready to go and play, or he's going to come in kind of say, hey, I'm going to dominate, I'm going to do whatever. And that's exactly how he came in. I almost feel like the encounter you had with him, where you kind of just went chest to chest, got things got a little heated, kind of woke him up and he was like, all right, this is this is the type of league we're in, let's go. That ended up being one yeah. of the best games of the season. But I got to ask you about that first big three game and just even that moment with Beasley. Were you trying to get under his skin a little bit or how did that, what really occurred there? Honestly, it was just, at first man, I was hella nervous. Cause like I play against him in the league, man. I was, this guy is so unguardable. Like he's he's like a freaking walking bucket. Like, <laughs> so I'm like, all right, man. I'm not about to get torched by this dude. Like if I let him be comfortable, like I'm done. Like there's no way I can keep up with this guy. Like so I was just being me. Like I'm just physical. And then like I saw him cooking in the beginning of the game. So I'm like, all right, man. We got I got like just disrupt this rhythm or something, man. He's just really out here playing like a pickup game. <laughs> like, he, he scored like 12 straight. I'm like, yo, we, you guys are bugging right now. <laughs> This guy's going to have 40 in a 50-point game. What are y'all doing? <laughs> and so after that, man, like, I'm just physical. Like, I'm bumping him. I'm not letting him go where he wants. Like, you know, I'm on it. I'm, like, at least staying in front of him, not fouling, and just hitting him. And it, he even said it, like, after the game. He's like, Jeff, man, like, you go out there throwing that big old body around, man. You got to chill with all that. Like, and then that's when I started to realize, I'm like, yo, some of these guys haven't played in a minute. Like, mm-hmm. like I just came here. So I'm, mm-hmm. like, I still, I still play. You know, so that's all I was doing, just bodying everybody. And then I talk shit. Like, I can't help it. Yeah. And he'd he be jawing, too. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, like, bro, I ain't afraid of nothing. Like, <laughs> I know ain't nobody really about that life. Ain't nobody's throwing no hands to cost no bread. Like, like, what's up? Like, you don't like me bullying you? You don't like me pushing you around? What you going to do? And then, and then, like, he was like, bro, that, I didn't think it was that bad, right? I'm just like, because I was calm the whole time. Usually mm-hmm. I'm talking crazy back. But I was just like chill and like when they when I saw that picture of him like screaming on me and then you just see the back of my head and I'm just like real calm looking I was like yo that's it was nuts like that was some fun that was so fun after that game I was like that was cool (laughs) but I think that was just kind of the case of two like inexperienced teams in the sense like a lot of guys within that game hadn't played in the league and that's what it felt like it was like uh, Mm -hmm. like from my perspective I was like yeah these guys know like they could be a little bit more physical like this is a a physical league, like they're going to get away with a little bit more than they realize. And like, I think for you, like kind of set the tone and kind yeah, of give a little bit of that spark into yeah. your own team. Heck yeah. That's what I was here for. Like, yeah. Like I'm like the enforcer, bro. Like I'm going to not be out here blocking a bunch of shots. Like I'm not doing a bunch of this wild athletic stuff, but you know, you feel my presence on the court. It's, it's a big difference, bro. <laughs> like <laughs> that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm talking on defense. Like we figuring stuff out. Like it's not just, you know, I'm out here just either trying to get buckets or 
you know, like I know my role. Like you got Joe Green on the team. Dude's he's you talking about Mike. Daryl was yeah. a walking bucket. Yeah. He's been a walking bucket for a for a long almost 20 years. You know what I'm saying? At the highest level. Mm-hmm. So sheesh. And he was showing he still got it too, man. He's out there killing. Yeah. Oh, I know my job. Hit hit some bodies, <laughs> get some rebounds, talk some trash. It's fun, man. You see, some people don't like it. They get really upset, and it takes them off their game. Mm-hmm. And some people get fired up. Those are the ones I like because then it's like when they start talking trash back, I got to back it up. Yeah. I love it. I, I love that. that. That's that's why you're the perfect player for this league. But I got to ask you, okay, so taking a little bit back, you Gerald gives you the call telling you that you're coming to Big Black. You're like, all right, cool. Like, that's dope. I get to join the league. Then you find out Gary Payton's going to be your head coach. What was GP like as a coach? What, you know, and, and that ex- first experience being in the big three, you're like, oh man, I got the, the shit talker of shit talkers right now. The, one of the best defenders ever. What's it like him being your head coach? It was pretty cool, man. Like, like I just, it was just cool. Like hearing like from him, you know what I mean? Like just like letting him talk and show you like how his mind works and the things he's thinking about being able to talk to him about stuff and, you know, him, respecting your opinion, helping you correct some stuff, giving you some insight to some things as well. It was, it was really cool, man. And then it, it wasn't even just him. It was like all of them. I mean, we walk around the arena. You're still seeing coaches. We go to the hotel. You see him around. And it's just like, like I'm talking to the Iceman. I'm like, man, you know that, that Spurs love runs deep, man. man. And so oh, it's yeah. Like, oh, yeah. You know, it, it's just mad cool. Like, just to see these guys, it, like the legends, the the – like my guys, like you got these younger guys that are making a name for themselves. It's just so cool, man. And hella competitive. That that's one thing. People think summer ball is like easy time. No, like if, you, if you're not coming out there ready to go, you're gonna get cooked. Mm-hmm. And it's on that, like it's on TV. This isn't like, yeah. oh, you know, maybe my family won't see it. Maybe it might make YouTube. No, this is live. Like people are watching this. And so like you better be on your toes, man. It's cool though. Yeah, no doubt. I mean. I feel like people talk a lot of times the summer is like that time in the trenches when they like really like putting in that work. And like for a lot of you guys, like you mm-hmm. play pretty much all year round essentially, but like, you know, playing in like an actual summer league, a professional summer league. I mean, that I'm sure is just like a different type of mindset you have to have to come in and like not only come in and get better, but, but dominate, like, you know, be really good. Yeah. So that's, that's really cool to hear. I, I want to ask, is there, was there any kind of adjustments to the style of play? I know everyone plays around three growing up, but for you, especially coming over from Japan, any kind of like adjustment or to the style that you had to make? Not really. Maybe just getting back used to like the NBA rules, like, you know, clearing defense in three seconds and stuff. But yeah. I mean, that's been such a habit for me that even in Japan, I kind of, I think I still do it. Like I'm always like looking to t- tag somebody, but um, no, it was just like the biggest adjustment was just learning the rules, yeah. you know, like air balls, you know, you don't have to clear it, just finish it. Uh, make sure you clear all the way outside the three-point line. Make sure you, you know, if you're in the post, make sure you clear out the, the paint. When the ball clears the three-point line, you can't just stay there. Yeah. And I was just, like, getting the use to those, those rules and what the pacing is like. Since you're not running full court, it's a little different. So, you know, but I loved it. It was, like, a good change of pace. I started watching more three-on-three basketball. The guys that play, like, international and, like, Olympic three-on-three is way different, man. That stuff's mm-hmm. – that stuff's hardcore. Those guys are elite athletes. It's it's really impressive. Yeah, like elite conditioning too. I mean, those guys are like yeah, because they don't running. stop. There's no like yeah. yeah, there's no like for us. We you know we check the ball back up top, mm-hmm. reset. Like no, they outlet <laughs> it quick. They're like trying to deflect the ball on the outlet. It's yeah. nonstop. These guys are exhausted at the end of these games. Like I'm like yeah, nah. This, if it was like that for us, it might get a little sloppy. These guys, we not all you know 26 anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like I like the reset too. That, that's a, just a lot to like handle. Like who's got possession, who just score, what just happened. Like I I personally like the the reset and everything. For you, like in your first season, Big Black, a little bit of a frustrating season, right? I mean, you guys lost four games by a total of eleven points. Your first three games, you guys went zero and three, and you lost every game by three points. I feel like you were about yeah. to win every single game, and just something happened. What do you feel yeah. like you guys could have done just a little bit differently that? to avoid some of those frustrating losses? Because this is a team that looked like it could have been 6-0, and honestly, by week six. Yeah, for sure. I think the biggest thing would have been we needed we needed to not settle for certain things. Like, the, the moments where we were really rolling, we were really, like, taking control over games, 
when we're like attacking the basket. Like Corey is attacking the rim. Gerald is doing his thing. But like when we all are starting to shoot like too many jump shots, Gary would say all the time, like, we need to attack, stop shooting, stop shooting. Like it's gonna hurt us. Like attack. They're gonna foul you. They can't guard you. Like get to the free throw line so we can get the ball back. Like, mm -hmm. you know, trying to have the strategy to it versus just, you know, oh, you scored, I score, you score, I score. And uh like the the aliens, man, they did such a good job, like running plays, playing off of each other. You know, I think they had like some of the smoothest offense mm -hmm. the, in the league. And that I think is like a great way to play through on three basketball. It's can't like it's great we have players like Gerald, Mike D, that like you can get the ball to and you know, nine times out of ten they're gonna get you a bucket. But like at the end of the game, these guys are, you know, exhausted. And, you know, it's a little bit tougher. So, you know, transition into using the offense to get easier buckets. Um that's it. And then some of the stuff was like silly mistakes, man. Like bad mm -hmm. fouls at the wrong time, fouling for a four point, like a four point play, or fouling for the and one three to lose a game. So it's like then silly mistakes. Don't I think Corey fouled somebody at the end of the game. They won. They they made the free throw. Then they got the ball back. Just like our mm -hmm. last game. Yeah. And then he then Dominic made the three, got fouled. And it was just like crap. Like that was like a good five point swing. And, you know, we were up by, like, three, yeah. you know, two. And we just needed, like, one point. And then they end up winning by two. It was nuts. It's yeah, crazy. you bring up an interesting point there, though, because, like, you mentioned Aliens having a smooth offense. But you also mentioned, too, like, Gerald and Beasley, like, good one-on-one -on -one players. I think there's that trying to find that balance. Because I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, for you guys, a little bit more, like, of a, a style or, like, an actual offense could have led you to that point. I think for aliens, while they got to the playoffs, even so, I feel like they were always missing that that guy who can go missing get that, the that, that guy. Mm -hmm. Exactly, sure. yeah. Because yeah. at end of games, it was sometimes tough to get buckets, especially with teams that I feel like over time teams started to adjust to what they were doing. So it's yep, finding that balance, definitely. I think. And I think for you guys too, like I know Garland came to the team a little bit later, but he he really started to look good toward the end of the year once he felt like yeah. a little bit more comfortable. I think that would have been a big game changer. Not saying Ike didn't make good contributions during his time there, but more so just like if Garland was there from the get go, I think that maybe it's a little bit of a different yeah. outcome because of his, some sure, of his intangibles. Yeah. yeah. Gelled quicker, like got his rhythm quicker and we all could have fed off of it. Like it was really weird. It's kind of hard to figure out how to do the teams. Like, do you want to go like two bigs and then you got like, I mean, look at uh, the enemies like with Earl and Amir, like they're Earl's like a three man, but he's like six nine. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's 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 tough. Like, how do you? And then you got like the teams that are all scars and one big, like like kind of like us. Like we mm -hmm. were two bigs with Ike and me, and then it was just like everybody's so small. We gotta keep everybody in check, like, and we don't want to switch too much. And you know, there's there's a lot of strategy involved with it when you're missing two more people or four more people, really. Yeah, I think bigs are always the biggest commodity. Uh, in that first round mm -hmm. of the draft because of their importance and their value, like you're mentioning. And I know like power the year they won it, they, they ran with a, a big lineup a lot. It's kind of what led them to the, to the finals and ultimately winning it. And I think a lot of teams mm -hmm. were trying to duplicate that. And now we're trying mm -hmm. to see the league shift a little bit, like for power, they were running big baby Birdman and Katina a lot of the time on their way, like in, in certain situations. And like that worked. Yeah. you kind of have a playmaker, you know, a guy who can get a bucket, a guy who's mostly a defender, but can rebound and, you know, be a, a, a rim runner or, you know, put shot, mm -hmm. like, you know, catch oops. And then you have big baby who's, you know, kind of can score in the post and whatnot, more of an offensive big. So it's interesting. I, I think as the league continues to shift and grow, like we'll continue to see like different styles and other teams try to copy that, that formula for success. I think so. They always do that, man. They yeah. That's how it works, bro. Like the Spurs win one of their first championships. Now everybody's going to Twin Towers. They're going two bigs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like that for a while. And That's so, a good you point. know, Golden State changed everything up. And now, or, you know, LeBron, they go big three. And it's like three superstars or, you know, three good guards. And then it's just, you know, you figure it out. Now you got four round one. Golden State stuff, and you got now it's like five out. Everybody's shooting three bigs or three point shooters. Guards is the one dunking on people now. It's crazy. It's like the world's gone upside down. <laughs> well, even you, I mean, you uh developed a little bit more of a three point shot. You were shooting a lot more this year, you know, and kind of getting comfortable yeah. with that. So it's it's nuts. Is that something that you've uh, recently developed, like 
added to like kind of your yeah. arsenal? I've had it for a while. I just didn't okay. shoot the ball that well. And gotcha. the that, I'm not gonna lie, that ball is terrible. That ball feels so bad. That's what I've heard. But what what like, is it about that ball? Is it just it's just, just so what it's made slippery, of? Slippery, man. Like when it gets wet or something, it's just really slippery. It's hard to like get a grip on it. And, mm-hmm. You know, most of these guys are so used to like NBA basketball, it's so sticky and like it has like a little weight to it. It just feels really good in your hands and when you shoot. And this ball is just like you try. You see a lot of guys are trying to do moves or trying to gather the ball, and it's just like. It slips out their hands, and yeah. they try to grab it one hand. And shrimp. So, but man, I, last couple of years, man, I've shot like over thirty-five, almost forty percent from three. Like I, got, like, I can shoot. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. My my bad for the disrespect for your three ball, but yeah, oh, you're no, really... you're good. That's why I was just like, he don't know. That's good. Like, <laughs> I can shoot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I hope they change the ball to just a regular like. I understand what they're trying to do. It's a brand thing, but I hope they just go back to a regular ball. You can put fireball three on it and make it a fire, a fireball. If that's what you want or make it a little darker, but I've heard that a ton. And like, you even hear it on the broadcast. It's like, Mm -hmm. you just hear people like, damn, somebody wet that ball off. You know, it's like, it's always, it's always slick. And I I think we'd see a lot better results, a lot of crazier plays. You know, like you said, if people can hold on to their dribble just a little bit longer, but just a little bit, just a little bit. Let me ask, what was your favorite moment from your, your rookie season in the big three? Uh, dang. That's tough. I think it can be on or off the court. Uh, I mean, honestly, the big the biggest thing that I that I love the most was probably just being back around these guys and getting that feeling of being like back in the NBA. You know, it's gonna sound really petty, but like, you know, go showing up at the airport, like you have the car waiting for you. You go to the hotel. You just – they give you the envelope, and it's like, here's your room. This is what time practice is. You know, this is the shuttle for tomorrow. Go have your day. I'm like, all right, man, this is cool. Like, the hotels were really nice. Mm-hmm. And it was just like a, you know, a real, like, first-class type of thing. It wasn't just, you know, a glorified pickup league. Like, you know, they really did it. They want to do right. And mm-hmm. so – it was just cool to see it like that and you know the players take it seriously the the company take it seriously and you know it's really like could be like a real avenue for a lot of guys it could be an avenue for guys trying to get into the league make training camp rosters after summer league make i mean look uh um we saw elijah stewart get a get a shot yeah elijah stewart after cooking us he went and got a a dang summer league deal you know what i mean dunking on me and now he's playing the summer league it's crazy (laughs) But it's just like, that's awesome, though. Like, you want to see guys get opportunities yeah. to showcase their talent at the highest level and get recognized. And then if not that, it's another level. Like, if there's ever a chance for guys to continue to uplift themselves and, like, their lives and their families through basketball, I mean, if the big three can help guys do that while still, you know, being able to help you make some money during the summer, it's, it's amazing, man. It's, it's yeah. As soon as more people really start to get into it, more people invest in it, more players want to play in it, it's really going to, I think, going to be bigger than uh, than people can think of, right, like, at the moment. Yeah, no, you're you're making excellent points. Like, something I, I try to tell people all the time as I try to get more people, like, just in my inner circle, like, more attracted to, like, what they're watching. Like, T, and T. Scott preaches this a ton. It's like, that's his main pitch every time he's talking to to bigger names or even guys that are a little bit younger that didn't necessarily mm-hmm. think like the big three was a route. Like you're making pretty decent money throughout the summer, but not only that, you're on a big stage, a big platform with a league that's really trying to emphasize and, and just bring awareness to what these like different players are doing currently within their mm-hmm. careers. So it, yep. it's going to, it's going to be cool to see how that continues to develop over time. And and hopefully we get a few more young guys in here. I'd love to see like, you know, some guys maybe that are go undrafted, uh, not necessarily go overseas. I know there's a ton of money to be made over there, but maybe like just try something like this in the summer and see what happens before they have to make that decision. Definitely, you know, like give themselves a real chance. Maybe somebody will give them a training camp invite or, you know, or some other team might give them a better deal. Or if not, like the thing about meeting people like this and being in these circles is like the people you get to be around, like mm-hmm. the people you network yeah. with, the people you get introduced to, it's, it's way bigger than like, there's no way I'd ever meet Gary Payton. Like what? Like I, I have no business ever meeting him. You know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. now like I've talked with him, like he knows me, I know him. Like 
And so now going forward, whenever I see him, it's not like, oh, dang, that's Gary Payton. It's like, yo, GP, what's up, man? It's like, yo, Jeff, yeah. what's up? Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And, and it could be like that for anybody because, like, the basketball community, like, fraternity, like, we're really small and, like, a tight-knit group. And everybody pretty much, like, you know, really looks out for each other. There's going to be times where it's like, all right, we're competing for the same job. But it's there's, like, this, you know, always, like, a mutual respect for one another and, you know, why not be around people who you can pick their brain and like learn yeah. something from that can help you wherever you end up going or it might help you 10, 15 years down later in your life. You never know. But <laughs> yeah, look back at these moments and say like, damn, I remember Gary Payton telling me that, or I remember Reggie Theus telling me this. I remember talking to Lisa Leslie and she's, you know, telling me this. So I tell my kids like while we're watching, you know, NBA on ESPN and they see Lisa Leslie get up there, start talking and they're like, Oh, dad, that's that's Lisa Leslie. She was in the big three coach. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, like that's that's Hall of Famer Lisa Leslie who does big three. <laughs> like, yeah, she's going, she's going to the she's one of the best women player ever. Yeah, and, you know, and then like see my my daughter see that, like my son see it. They're just exposed to high level basketball, like as a young player, as a fan. Like, why would you not want that? That sounds yeah. great. Yeah, it's connections. You're learning more about the game development. Like, I, I think there's a lot of pros, like you're saying. And it's just about trying to get other people to recognize that and continue to just see how the competition grows. I think at the end of the day, too, it's just, you know, you're competing for something like a championship. It's an opportunity to do that. It's an opportunity to get drafted again. Maybe if you didn't get that opportunity, it's a chance to compete against some of the best in the world. If if you're going to be a pro somewhere else in the world, it's a chance to really get some good competition in. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on everything you're saying and hope people more more people recognize that. Real quickly, want to talk about some awards because every in every league, there's some snubs for some awards. Like for me personally, mm-hmm. I thought I thought Gerald was going to get Rookie of the Year. That's that's no slight to to uh, Glenn Rice Jr. who had an amazing season, but I did think Gerald probably deserved that a little bit more. That's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you about about a certain award that I saw you comment on is a trash talk. <laughs> of the you feel like you yeah. were snubbed that award because you were talking every game there. Like you said, you're a shit talker. So there's a lot of talking from you every game. Do you feel like you were snubbed a little bit? Maybe. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe maybe my, my my film wasn't reviewed quite well enough. <laughs> <laughs> but shit, you know, that's cool. Like that's like, give me some motivation. I told him I'm coming, I'm coming back next year. Yeah. I'm get I'm getting mine. <laughs> so it's it's cool. I like it. It's got I feel like a lot of uh, coaches have been winning it. Like GP's a you know, a multiple time winner of that award. So it's cool to see players mm-hmm. win it a little bit more because you know, we have some we have some good coaches in this league, Hall of Fame coaches, but we got some coaches that'll, as you've probably seen, will go at it with some players. Oh heck, it, heck yeah! I'll be talking. I'll be if I hear him, I'm talking colder than too. Like, <laughs> I, I I feel so bad. I remember what the game we was playing. Like, I remember giving Lisa Leslie like a little glare, like, "Oh, I could shoot this damn ball. You better get this fool out here." And, march. <laughs> and then I was like, "Damn, Jeff, what are you doing? Like, it's Lisa Leslie, bro, calm your butt down. Like, chill." But it's just like you can't. Sometimes you can't. They're like, "Yo, he can't shoot." What'd you say? Or like the little fans on the sideline. Mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. that's the fun part. They're like, "As you can't shoot." I'm like, "What'd you say?" Oh, I can't hear you say that again. <laughs> so, yeah, I could get lit. It don't matter. It's more fun with the players though. Like the players, like oh yeah, guys are all competing, and it's just it's such a it's like another level of the game. A lot of people think it's like people acting crazy, just mm-hmm. talking angry. It's like strategy, man. It's it's like a mind game. It may look like mo- all of us are out of control, but it's really like a chess match. Yeah. You waiting to just see who caves in first, like who really gets mad, and then whoever <laughs> gets mad first loses. So it's fun. That's it. Uh, so you just concluded your first big three season. For you, what's next in the books? You mentioned playing in Japan. I know you played over there. Had a few stints over there. Um, you know what? What do you? What is next for you? Do you plan to go back and play overseas in Japan? Uh, or in another country, or you know, are you kind of riding out this big three wave and seeing where that can take you? No, I'm trying to get like another year or two done. 35, like, uh, you know, I'm missing a lot of the kids' time and stuff, and so I want to get, you know, I want to go and, uh, you know, be back around, be home a little more, probably start getting some coaching stuff. But uh, I need to get. I want something though, man. I'm not done yet. I don't, I don't my body doesn't feel like it's done. It's mm-hmm. just I'm kind of just waiting, man. Like it's October. So it's, it's not really the time for people to get picked up. You kind of just gotta wait and see what happens. So 
I'm just training, man, just staying ready as I can and, you know, kind of putting it in God's hands and see what happens. Facts, 100%. What do you like about Japan? Or is it more so, like, do you like Japan itself or, like, just, like, the leagues over there? Because uh, it, It's both, man. Honestly, yeah. it's really a dope league. Like, you know, it, uh, besides it being super far, it's, you know, the weather is really nice. The, mm -hmm. um, the food is really good. The people are super friendly. Like, the work environment is nice. There's no, um, you know, like you hear some of these guys that go to Europe and their, you know, teams are two, three months behind. You know, Japan, you're getting paid on time. Your games are every weekend. You play Saturday, Sunday. You mix some Wednesdays in there. So now you know you get, like, Monday off every week. So, you know, you could kind of, like, you have some rhythm. NBA schedule, Euroleague schedule, it's just hectic, man. Like, yeah. it's nonstop. You don't even know where you are most of the time. Like, what country am I in? What time is it? Like, where are we? At least there, you're just like, you hop on a bullet train or a bus. Yeah. You have your games and you're back, back home, you know, that day. Enjoy your day off. Get back to work, you know, during the week. It's really cool. It's like a good rhythm, man. And they love basketball. So that's yeah. really fun, too. Yeah, I'm a little biased uh, being half Japanese, you know, being to Japan. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I agree with a lot of things you're saying. But I think that's the biggest point, too, is, like, the fans there are, like, really committed uh, in any sport or in, for any other team. So it's got to be a, yeah. a dope environment. And I got to say, bullet trains are underrated. Like, the Sleepers. best thing you can do. Yeah, like, underrated. Sleeper. To hop on that it's and just travel a... wherever you want to go. Yeah, and, like, you don't even understand and realize, like, how fast you're really going. Like, mm -hmm. you're doing a cool 150, almost 200 miles an hour on a train and just seeing, like, the dopest countryside or cities just flying past your window. And you're just comfortable. You don't feel nothing. You feel like you're sitting on the cloud. It's it's insane, yeah. man. It's one of the coolest things. Well, uh, wishing you the best of luck, hoping you get picked up and, and you're put in the right situation uh, this season. Excited to see you back next summer, uh, hopefully with Gerald again, so you guys can run it back and actually, you know, get over 500, make sure you guys get in the playoffs and everything. But Heck I got yeah. to say, I enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate the time. Best of luck until next summer. And uh, excited to see what you guys do when uh, awesome. Big Three 2023 rolls around. Awesome. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me on here. It's really dope. Yes, appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, guys, that was our interview with Jeff Ayers. I want to say thank you again to Jeff for coming on the show. And it's just so funny because Jeff is someone that's always kind of been in the back of my head. Uh, I've mentioned on the show and I mentioned in the interview, I'm a huge James Harden guy. And Jeff actually played with James during his time as Arizona State. So crazy that like I'm actually, I was actually able to talk to him and just kind of talk about the days when I, I first recognized Jeff, Jeff Ayers. It's just so weird that it's like full circle almost. And it's like, I'm such a big James Harden guy throughout college. And he went and played with James Harden. And then ultimately, like our past does ended up to us somehow being tied to the big three. So pretty crazy how life works there. But thank you again. Don't get enough bivouac representation. So always just a little bit more appreciated. I feel like when we get someone from bivouac or aliens, just because can't ever get them, uh, the guys who represent the team on the show. I, I don't know if I'm just. They they think I'm a hater from the outside looking in, or I just don't I just don't vibe well with those guys. But nonetheless, again, thank you to Jeff, and thank you to everyone who tuned into today's episode. Want want again, you know, give a, another shout out to the Big Three um, becoming the the first black owned professional sports league. You know, certified as the first black owned professional sports league, and and the only one. Once again, um, just a huge milestone. Can't reiterate that enough. And and looking forward to the 2023 season. Again, if you guys aren't already, make sure you're following the show at Fourth Man Pod on social media, youtube.com slash Fourth Man Pod. Make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell on there. And to everyone on Dash Radio and the Nothing But Net channel, we thank you. And we'll see you guys the next time. <laughs>